Um, well, good morning, uh, everybody. It's nice to see you all and thank you for coming along today. Uh, my name is Dr. Meera Sabaratnam and I am the uh, undergraduate admissions tutor for the politics department. Uh, with me is uh, Dr. Tolga Sinsen-Mazdamir, who's my colleague, who is the BA politics uh, and joint degrees uh, convener. And we've also been joined, I believe, by our head of department, uh, Dr. Felix uh, Berenskota. Uh, so I am um, gonna just ask my colleagues to briefly introduce themselves. Uh, and let's start with Tolga. Uh, say a bit about yourself and your background and, and why you became an academic. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this virtual open day. Uh, we are very happy to have you with us today. Uh, my name is Tolga Sudmazdemir. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Politics and International Studies. Uh, I did my PhD at uh, New York University and I joined SOAS in 2019. And before coming to SOAS, I worked at LSC. Uh, most of my teaching in the department is about uh, modules that focus on research methods and political analyses. Uh, my research is about mostly political conflict and especially about certain consequences of conflict and specifically forced migration. Uh, most of my recent research is about uh, the Syrian civil war and the Syrian refugees. Uh, I work these topics uh, by doing uh, public opinion surveys, both among Syrian refugees as well as amongst the host populations that are uh, currently hosting Syrian refugees. Um, why did I become an academic? Well, <laughs> my decision was very early on. Uh, even when I was in, in high school, I was pretty sure that I'm gonna become an academic because I simply wanted to, uh, uh, I was fascinated by the political world uh, and I, really wanted to spend most of my adult life, professional life on trying to understand politics in various different contexts and especially how sort of political power, power works. Um, I guess that's a very quick summary of my past and present as an academic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tolga, that's fascinating. Um, Felix. Good morning. Um... Uh, colleagues and prospective applicants. Can you see me? I, I don't know if there's a video. Yes, yeah? We can. yeah, great. Yeah. Um, so, my name is Felix Beonskota. I'm the head of Department of Politics and International Studies. Um, I've been at SOAS and in the department uh, for 12 years. Um, I'm originally from Germany, but did my um, studies in the US and uh, my PhD in London. Um, I am an expert in international relations, international politics, broadly speaking, but for the last two years, I've been um, the head of department, uh, which basically means that I'm less involved in teaching, although I do try to teach um, every year, um, simply because it's the most fun part of the job. Um, in, in many ways, uh, all I want to say is that uh, this, this department is one that is, that is special, is particular uh, in many ways. And, and the reason why I ended up here, well, there's number one, because, uh, you know, they offered a, an opening in, in, in London and I lived in London at the time. Uh, but it is also because it offers a perspective on the world that no other um, politics department offers to you. Um, the, the expertise in Asia, Africa and the Middle East is, is unrivaled and, um, you know, moving from a non-Western or looking at uh, global issues from a non-Western perspective is really is really what uh, what what we excel in, and I think that is that, that is really what what attracts me um, um, uh, to this place, and which is why I'm 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 really thrilled um, to you know to work with my colleagues and try to try to encourage you and convince you um, to apply um, to to this to our programs. I don't want to say much more um, other than the diversity. Um, of our perspectives is mirrored by the diversity of our staff. Um, we have staff from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, um, they come from all over the world. Uh, they, they, they speak multiple languages, um, uh, but so are our students. Our student body is, is you know, is not one that, uh, I mean, you would expect in London to have, um, you know, a, a plural multicultural environment in any case. But I think SOAS, uh, you know, um, tops this even more. So the, the diversity of our students um, is, is what I think makes this most exciting and, and inspiring um, to both uh, teach and to, to research. And uh, yeah, so I hope you will be convinced at the end of this hour. Thanks. 
Uh, thank you, Felix. Um, and I'll just add a bit more about myself. So um, I'm also a, a specialist in international relations. I didn't actually think I was going to be an academic. I thought I was going to be a music journalist for the majority of my undergraduate days. Um, uh, but I missed studying, actually, when I finished. And um, I liked thinking about politics. And um, the more I learned about it, the more fascinated I was. Um, also, having family who were from Sri Lanka, I was particularly interested in war and violence and conflict and peace building. And I ended up writing my PhD about um, peace building in Mozambique. And in fact, many of the ways in which international aid wasn't that helpful in terms of um, solving the country's uh, problems. And so what I work on now is a combination of um, theories and concepts, um, particularly around coloniality and race. And um, I'm currently working on a new project about the impact of global debt in how we shape international uh, politics. So this is a fascinating environment in which to um, work and study. And I would echo what Felix said about um, the exciting nature of SOAS as a community. OK, but before we get into all of that, let's take a step back and think about what it means to study uh, politics. Um, many of you might have been looking at it at A level, um, but I thought I'd give you a flavour of maybe how we approach it at um, undergraduate level and also in a sort of academic uh, setting. Broadly speaking, what we're talking about is the organisation of power in society. This is a massively important question. Obviously, it affects all of us um, from the wealthiest to the least wealthy, from the most powerful to the least powerful um, and everywhere in between. Now, we look at this in several uh, different ways. I think one of the ways in which we think about it is through um, what we might call formalized systems, that is um, the formal institutions of government, parliaments, elections, cabinets, uh, the laws and treaties that are formalized as part of the political world. Everybody kind of understands that that is uh, the stuff of politics. However, we also go beyond that to think about um, ideas, the world of ideas, the values, the norms that shape not only um, the way we contest politics, but also the way we think about politics, um, the frames of reference or the identities or the locations in which you place people have an enormous impact on the distribution of political power in society. Finally, we also think about what I would call social structures and forces. So these are the big things that impact our lives, such as uh, gender, race, uh, capitalism. These are large, impersonal um, structures that nonetheless reproduce themselves over time and in ways which um, greatly impact the distribution of power. We can also think about grand processes such as the uh, ecological destruction, climate change, um, and the organization of the economy um, and corporate power. So we've got all of these different layers to the political world and how power is organized in society. What we do when we study politics um, is that we try to develop the methodologies and the tools and the concepts to help us study these systematically, not just saying, oh, that looks a bit weird and that looks a bit weird, but actually looking at them comparatively, trying to define what's going on, trying to understand the mechanisms and the dynamics. And we hope this gives us better ways of asking questions about politics and also ways of testing the uh, answers. And so what we're really trying to do with a politics degree or an international relations degree is train your brain to see the workings of power in society and to see it in ways which are clear and analytical and focused and rigorous. All right, so I want to actually bring you into the conversation um, now and let's think about how we might approach some of these issues. So I would like some suggestions from yourselves. Um, you can either um, uh, unmute yourselves and speak or put the answers in the chat. Um, so in your view, what are some of the big political issues of the present? Like what is it that gets you kind of motivated or makes you think or makes you cross or makes you uh, interested? So we've got climate change um, from an India and we've got Shalini saying inequality. I think these are really key um, issues. Let's think about climate change. Like, what do we think about when we think about the politics of climate change? Obviously, there is a huge um, issue that affects basically everybody on the globe. But as a political scientist, you would say, well, it's affecting people very unequally, right? And so there are those with lots of power in terms of um, how things are organized in order to be able to change these things. But these are not the same people who are being affected necessarily immediately by the impacts of climate change. 
So immediately we can see that the different locations of the power, um, the power holders and those who are affected is part of the problem here, it's part of the political order. And then we can loop in questions like ideology, we can loop in questions like the structures of capitalism that help us make sense of how and why climate change kind of continues to be a problem. Um, Tolga, there's some other um, points in the chat. Did you want to pick one up? We won't be able to answer all of them necessarily. Uh, sure, absolutely. Let's follow in the list. Inequality, right? So Shalini is mentioning inequality. Uh, that's certainly a topic that we would be interested in as, as political science scholars. And uh, perhaps one advantage of looking at inequality as a political science scholar, rather than right, as a scholar of economics, right? We would actually try to understand inequality uh, in its various facets, including, right? So the political factors behind inequality, right? We wouldn't suppose we are interested in causes of uh, uh, income inequality or wealth inequality, right? While a standard economist would try to explain this only with reference to economic factors, right? As a political science scholar, you would have the opportunity to go a little deeper, right? You would know that many economic processes, including those who produce these inequalities, these vast differences in income and wealth are not only, right? Uh, explicable by reference to, to, to economics, to markets, to market forces, so to speak, but certainly to political actors as well, like the state, for instance, right, or, or, or sort of strong interest groups. Um, so that would be one way you would actually approach uh, the topic of inequality specifically from a, a politics angle, right? Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, uh, as, as political science scholars, right, we would have the, the sort of the, the, the opportunity, right, or the capacity, right, to look at various manifestations of inequality across different contexts and try to understand why inequality levels change, why the nature of inequality is different across different countries, uh, uh, so on and so forth. So that is some of the ways in which I believe we as political scientists would approach a topic like uh, uh, inequality. Thank you. Um, I can see Felix. Felix, did you want to come in on one of these? Otherwise, I might tackle the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, yeah, I, I would have just uh, picked this up, but I can I can leave it to you. But I would, uh, what I would do is to say that conflict is, of course, one of the big themes um, that that we study, and whether it is a specific conflict such as that one. Um, or it is it is a um, a broader question of why why do wars happen why why over and over again or how has the nature of war and and violence changed um, where do we see the causes for these um, you know for for these conflicts and it isn't just about looking at one conflict in isolation you would also ask you know how is a particular conflict linked to uh, broader dynamics in world politics for instance or to um, domestic politics. Uh, so if you take uh, something like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you would also have to um, look, you, you know, look beyond that and think about, um, you know, the historical conditions that created it. You have to think about great power politics that are involved. Um, and you would have to go, you know, beyond and you have to think about implications, uh, you know, let's take um, the, the region of the Middle East as a whole um, of a war such as the one in Syria, um, you know, the implications in terms of, for instance, uh, refugees and streams of migration, um, the shifting balances of power, the involvement um, of other actors such as, you know, Iran, uh, Russia, um, uh, the United States, um, and so forth. So I think there are really important questions about conflicts that we tackle that are both about conflicts, uh, a very particular conflict, but also the broader context in which these occur, both the international, the domestic, and the historical dynamics. Thank you. I mean, yes, and just to pick up um, and kind of um, illustrate what Felix was saying with regard to the Israel-Palestine conflict, I mean, one of the things that you would become aware of when reading the literature about the conflict is that there are at least three models for understanding what is going on um, in Israel and Palestine. And what is interesting about the scholarship is that it also is affected by the political struggle uh, itself. So one model would be to see um, Israel-Palestine as a security issue uh, defined by um, terrorism and its effects on uh, the Israeli state and to uh, look at it through that particular framework. 
Another framework would see it as an ethnic conflict driven by identity, driven by religion or belief or um, the sheer identification of people as being from different uh, groups and backgrounds. And a third framework would look at it as a um, as a colonial or anti-colonial conflict about uh, settlement, about dispossession um, and about the kinds of um, violence and resistance that that entails. And um, what is interesting about something like the Israel-Palestine conflict is that um, both what is happening on the ground and the explanations themselves become sites of contestation because particular explanations you can see ally themselves to particular um, political outcomes. And one of our jobs as scholars is to try and disentangle or distinguish the good arguments from the bad in order to understand with most precision and robustness what is actually um, going on. Um, thank you so much for your um, wonderful answers. We don't have time to tackle more of them now, unfortunately, but these are exactly the kinds of things that we would um, be looking at in the degree and that you'd have the opportunity to uh, explore. I did flag a couple of other questions just in case you were quiet, but um, that would not um, necessarily have happened with a SOAS group. So um, uh, we've already discussed climate change. I'll, I'll leave that one there. I'll briefly talk about this one, though, because I think this is a key issue in politics um, at the moment. How do social media and other surveillance technologies shape what it means to be a uh, citizen? So the question of citizenship is, of course, central to uh, politics. It gives you a set of rights. It gives you a set of obligations. It gives you an identity. It gives you privileges and so on. Um, and it gives you a relationship to the other people who are part of your political order. Now, the traditional view of citizenship, or at least the liberal kind of um, view of citizenship, is that citizens are rational individuals who come together both for their personal good and also for the collective good. And that the act of citizenship is about participating in a transparent political order. That's what democracy is and having one's voice um, heard. Now, what social media does, of course, is totally change the way in which you experience the world, the way in which you understand what arguments are being put out there, the way in which algorithms shape what information you're presented with, um, the way in which particular information becomes more prominent, um, particularly um, information which is kind of counter, counter hegemonic or counter cultural. And that radically changes not just let's say your rationality, but it works at the level of your emotions, right? Social media is actively working on your emotions all the time to make you engage with it. Um, and what does that mean for how we understand our relationships to each other as, cit as citizens uh, and the way in which democracy works? There are lots of big questions to ask about this. Um, and that's one of the key things that we would like to look at um, in the study of politics today. Uh, Tolga, I think we have a question here, a last question for you to answer. Sure, Mira. Another question, right, that we might be interested in as students of politics, right? Um, if you look at around the world, right, if you look around the world to countries that are large exporters of oil, right, for which oil is a very significant share of their exports, um, and you look at their sort of political regimes, political systems, right, most of the time, these countries are not necessarily the most democratic, ones, right? So then that brings the question, how actually does oil wealth shape the likelihood of democracy in different contexts, right? So think about Saudi Arabia, think about Russia, think about Venezuela, think about Nigeria. So then we as students of politics would wanna answer this question and one way in which we can think about answering this question would be, well, what are the channels, right, through which oil wealth might perhaps influence, right, the kinds of political systems that that citizens live under. And then when we ask that question, we would start thinking about sort of different causal mechanisms that can link oil wealth to, to political regimes. We might, for instance, say, well, in uh, countries with significant amount of natural resources and oil wealth, right, states are less likely or do need less to tax their citizens as a result of which they feel less uh, obliged to listen to the views of their citizens, which lead to less chances of proper democratic representation, which then increases the chances of a authoritarian regime, right? So that's one way we can think about this question as students of politics. Now, in addition to that, we can also look at this relationship, again, across different contexts, 
right? Uh, we can look at this relationship in places like, as I told you, Saudi Arabia or Russia or Venezuela, but then there is also a Norway, right? Where despite significant amount of oil wealth, uh, uh, Norway seems to have a pretty strong democratic regime. So then we would start comparing, right? We would start looking for similarities and differences between these cases. And then perhaps you would say, well, if the country is relatively underdeveloped or poor to begin with, then perhaps oil wealth is detrimental to democracy, but otherwise it's perhaps not, right? So this is just another way in which we as students and scholars of politics would approach uh, the question of oil wealth uh, shaping regimes around the world. And this question is not going anywhere, right? So despite predictions in the past that you know oil would become less important as a source of energy, that doesn't seem to be the case. So uh, uh, questions of these type will certainly continue to keep us busy as students and scholars uh, of politics. Um, Mira? Thank you, Tolga. Um, okay, well, that brings us nicely onto the question of what do we do here at SOAS and how do we teach and study uh, politics here in the department? Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of background about our department. Um, we're very highly ranked, uh, which is a nice thing. Rankings aren't everything, um, but we've been recently uh, um, ranked as the fifth best department in the UK and the seventh in Europe and the 21st in the world, uh, which is a nice thing to um, hear. And that's to do with our academic reputation, um, how well we teach um, and the um, value added we have for our students. We have award-winning and impactful research as measured by the National uh, Research Excellent Framework excellence framework and our national student survey scores um, show that we have consistently uh, excellent teaching and that's one of the nice things about being uh, in this department. As Felix already mentioned we have a very active and diverse um, body of staff and students. I think we have um, amongst our sort of 30 something staff at least kind of 12 or 13 nationalities. Amongst our student body um, I did a count a couple of years ago about our undergraduate student body and I counted uh, 60 nationalities. So it's really a very exciting um, place to work and be. And I think uniquely we have a breadth and a depth of regional and subject uh, specializations. Uh, we don't just have one person working on Africa. We've got several people um, with different layers of expertise that really gives you that depth, um, which you wouldn't necessarily get elsewhere. Uh, here's a quick look at our faces. And um, this is our uh, politics faculty. And you'll see that we're a very um, mixed group in terms of age and gender and uh, ethnicity and background. And it makes it a really exciting uh, and fun place to um, work. And hopefully uh, you'll get to study with lots of these exciting people um, in the future years. All right, I'm gonna move on to talking about our undergraduate degrees now. Um, our undergraduate degrees are basically organized around four core elements. So these are first disciplines and concepts. So even though we do things differently, we still make sure that you get all of the bread and butter basic material that you need uh, to study politics and international relations and that have been developed in these fields over time. So you will get a good grounding in um, where the discipline is, what are the key concepts, what are the terms that you're going to encounter over and over again. Second, we are very strong on particularly the regions of Asia, Africa and the Middle East, but we see them in a global context and a global perspective. We see them in their historic relations, not just with the former imperial powers, but also with each other. And we also think about the wider world, including the West, as it relates to um, different parts. So we have a strong regional uh, emphasis. Again, that is a very unique feature. The third way in which we organize our degrees is around, um, is around global issues. So particularly in your third year, you would get to study specific issues in depth, um, those that you've already mentioned, such as climate change, such as security, also migration, also technology, uh, and so on. So we want to make sure that you have very different ways of cutting up the cake with disciplines and concepts, with regions and with issues, so that you can really think across and around them. And the final element, which I think is in all of our modules, is this idea that we need to study from multiple perspectives or standpoints. So that is to say, we don't just say, look, this is knowledge and then you learn it. We say, okay, this is knowledge from this perspective, but you also have this other way of thinking about this thing from this other perspective. And we need to look at how those things interact and see that interaction also as a political process. 
And that's one of the things that I think we emphasize. And I think that's one of the things that makes our study of politics um, richer. In terms of overall in the UK, obviously you'll be thinking about other um, universities. I would say what makes our programs very distinctive is that regional content, content and that um, multi-perspectival multi content. And we also have this emphasis on thinking from below. And I think that's one of the key um, things that has, in a, in a way constrained the study of politics historically. It's always been from above, it's always been from this kind of elite point of view. Um, whereas many of the scholars, not just in our department, but across SOAS are very committed um, to thinking about things from below. So you heard Tolga talking about his work, like he's surveying refugees about what they think, not just what other people think about refugees, but how they understand their own situations. Um, my work as well is about um, international aid it has been, and not just what the donors think about international aid, but what the people who are receiving the aid think about international aid. Okay, so that takes you on to um, our specific degrees. I'm gonna we're gonna run through the um, programs a little bit now, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you might choose between them. So we've got a new program, which I wanted to um, front load, which is the BSc in Politics, Philosophy and Economics. And this is a collaboration between the departments of politics, uh, religions and philosophy and economics at SOAS. And it is a very interdisciplinary degree and it gives you a grounding in these very different ways of thinking about the world, but which in some ways speak to each other and to common um, problems. So something like inequality, uh, you have to understand it from a political angle in terms of rights and obligations and power. You need to understand it from an economic angle in terms of how income inequalities work and how economists think about them. But you also need to think about it from a philosophical level. What are the philosophies that analyze or justify or reject inequality and how do they organize themselves? So you'd have the opportunity to think about, let's say, how um, Indian philosophies have justified caste inequalities, how that interacts with um, income inequality in India, and also the political inequalities between India and its neighbors or between India and, and the wider world. So that interdisciplinary approach really gives you an insight and you build that up as you go up over the three years. As I've mentioned, we emphasize the global nature of these problems and the need to understand both the Western and the non-Western um, approaches. What is key, I think, about this degree, about all our degrees really, is that we really make sure that you apply the knowledge. So you do learn theory, you do learn concepts, um, but you learn why they matter, right? You learn how they act in the world. You learn why the use of different languages or different frameworks um, affects how we understand things. And overall, this degree in particular has something which is very attractive to employers, which is the ability to work in different modes, different analyses, different kind of ways of thinking. And that connects different analytical positions. So it's like training for the triathlon instead of just the marathon, right? You are learning lots of different skills. You're becoming agile in lots of different ways. And that gives you a particular kind of um, package. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Tolga now to talk about our BA politics and joint degrees, of which he's a convener. Uh, thank you, Mira. Why don't you run the whole slide perhaps? So that sure. uh, all the three bullet points. So yeah, our politics degree has certain unique features. And I'm not gonna talk about particular modules now that you would take if you do a politics degree at SOAS or if you do a politics degree together with another degree, but I will rather tell you about what I believe are the unique features of our politics degree. So first, right, as a broad sort of message to you, our politics degree does not only focus on sort of formalized systems of politics, as, as Mira put it, right? We do not just study governments, we do not study just constitutions or electoral systems, but we do also study ideologies, norms, social structures, uh, anything basically that happens within the borders of countries, anything that happens as part of what we call domestic politics is the subject matter uh, of our degree. So as such, we would have the opportunity to study a very popular topic nowadays, for instance, populism, right? Or, or a, a violent conflict that happens within countries, such as civil wars, right? Uh, protest movements, right? Uh, uh, so all these topics are very much part of our politics degree. Now, how do we do this, right? How do we study a, a, and teach you these, these, these topics, right? So first thing that we do is that 
we cover both sort of mainstream but also critical approaches to politics. Right? So what does that mean? That means that uh, um, in every topic that we cover, we do not only read sort of classic texts or sort of uh, typical mainstream scholars that have worked on these topics, but we also study the scholars who have uh, problematized, right? Who have uh, uh, adopted a critical approach to these sort of mainstream classic texts and scholarly works. Uh, scholars who have problematized, right? So the relationship between these mainstream scholars and power hierarchies uh, that are very much part of the political world, for instance. Uh, in addition to that, right, a second unique feature of our degree is that you will have the opportunity to acquire a really deep knowledge in one of the regions that SOAS has been specializing for, for, for a very long time, Asia, Africa, uh, and the Middle East. And when I say that, I do not only mean that uh, my colleagues have deep knowledge of these areas that they will uh, uh, share with you, but in addition to that, my colleagues in the department do research themselves in these regions, right? So when they talk about uh, different parts of Asia, Africa, or the Middle East in their modules, it's not just, you know, conveying to you knowledge that others produce, but actually conveying to you also knowledge that they themselves have produced, right? And just to give you some examples, right? So I mentioned to you, I, for instance, uh, specialize in, in, in parts of the Middle East, especially the, the, the question of Syrian civil war and Syrian refugees. Um, another colleague of mine, Phil Clark, has deep expertise on Rwanda, for instance, and especially post-conflict justice proce uh, procedures in, in Rwanda. Um, in addition to sort of this opportunity to, to, to really learn about one or one region or more than one region in the, uh, around the world, you can do this together with studying a particular language. Right? You can either take modules to study a language of your choice, or you can actually combine the politics degree with a degree in a language like Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, or Korean. And then finally, uh, uh, as Mira emphasized, we certainly also emphasize in this degree uh, uh, multiple perspectives on these key issues of domestic politics around the world. Um, so you might be interested in migration, you might be interested in environmental justice, you might be interested in politics of the ongoing COVID pandemic, you might be interested in either specific cases of conflict like Israel-Palestine conflict or conflicts around the world in general, right? So as we study these topics, we adopt multiple perspectives. And what I mean by that is that we do not approach these topics only from the point of view of po policymakers, right, the power holders, but also from the point of view of what I would call policy disruptors, those who are supposed to be subject to certain policy decisions, but who themselves may actually uh, uh, respond, confront, challenge those policies, which would certainly give you uh, the ability to, to, to and the skills to, to approach each of these topics uh, from multiple angles, which I believe will be very helpful to you, uh, whatever career choice you make after you finish your, your degree. Um, that's all from my end. Uh, Mira, back to you. Thank you. Um, and I'll just run quickly through the international relations um, and joint degrees. So again, I mean, I think you've probably got the message by now that, that how we study international relations is also from beyond the traditional Western perspective. International relations as a field, to some extent, is even more, has historically been even more Western than a lot of other fields, because it's been about how to manage power relations and how to manage um, global order. So again, we cover those mainstream ideas and debates within the programme, but then we, we go beyond it. We, even from our first year, start to think about how to challenge that and how to get away from this smaller view of what the world is into this bigger one, into this more global or worldly um, approach. As I mentioned at the beginning, we're very interested in thinking about how where you stand shapes your perspectives. How does international relations look from Beijing or Tehran or Johannesburg? How do we think about world order when understood from those um, locations, elite or um, non-elite, right, or from the masses? One of the things that our international relations degree does, though, is emphasize the interconnected nature of world order. So we're not just kind of in little countries 
all separate, but for various structural and historical reasons, we are enmeshed, we are entangled, and we want to give you a sense of how that affects how world order uh, works. Okay, so just to move quickly then on to choosing a program. Um, some of you might be thinking about which of these programs is most interesting to you. I would say by and large, people are pretty happy with the choices that they make, even though all of the choices are in some sense attractive. Um, as Tolga's mentioned, the politics and um, joint politics degrees are mostly emphasizing politics within borders. So what we would understand as domestic politics, that gives you a bit more depth into sort of the nature of political systems or comparative analyses. Um, and it also gives you scope to study political theory in a bit more depth. With international relations, we're looking more at politics across borders, thinking about forms of global inequality, war, violence, um, uh, religion, these kinds of issues that we can see as kind of grand, largely transnational uh, phenomena. But of course, we see how they connect. Uh, and a very popular combination is, of course, politics and international relations together, where you get um, a fair degree of both. Now, these two uh, traditions, politics and international relations, as I said, can be combined with each other or with any of these other combinations uh, listed on the slide. Um, and if you're interested in those um, other areas, we'd also encourage you to go to the open days um, for those departments as well. And finally, the politics, philosophy and economics, which is actually my uh, undergraduate degree as well, um, gives you that multidisciplinary approach to studying uh, societies. So you might do um, disciplines in less depth, but you'll have lots more perspectives from which to understand uh, the world. OK, um, coming towards the last bit in, in a little bit, I'm going to talk about what you can do after your degrees. Um, but before that, I just wanted to give you a sense of our students who had been through the programs, what they ended up doing for their final dissertation. So I've listed some titles here um, from this year's lot of uh, dissertations. Uh, and some of these were, were my students. Um, I supervised a dissertation about land dispossession in South Africa. Um, and the students gone on to um, be off to place to do a master's at St. Andrews. Um, the student who worked on AI powered surveillance has gone off to do a master's in data science in um, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I've got a student who wrote the uh, View to the Sea uh, dissertation about the UK's response to the rise of China, who's now working in the Scottish Parliament thinking about um, healthcare and social care policy. So you've got lots and lots of um, students here who are doing fascinating projects, who are going on to do fascinating uh, things, who have really developed from you know, where you are standing right now, maybe at the end of your school time, to becoming very advanced uh, uh, critical thinkers and able to do a range of, a range of things. Uh, Tolga, did you wanna add anything about the final projects before we go into the discussion about uh, life after uni? Yeah, just very briefly, I would say that this is really a fantastic opportunity for our students to work on a project of their own from beginning to the end. Uh, you start with a topic that you're interested in, you do some original research on the topic, and you work on it, and then, and, and then you finish it. So it will give you an opportunity to work on a topic uh, in a slightly longer format than you would usually do in your assessments writing essays. Uh, and as such, uh, based on my experience of teaching it from last year, our students have tremendously benefited from it. Uh, and some of which have even considered to, to use this project perhaps to, to try to publish it somewhere. So I think it's really a, a, a great opportunity for, for our students. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and of course, you'd be supervised by a member of staff um, who would give you support through that process. OK, so our last little section before the Q&A is going to be um, uh, is going to be on what you can do afterwards, um, which many of you will be interested in. So as with a lot of university degrees, we also emphasize um, the transferable skills that you can develop through our programs. Um, as I mentioned, this is kind of like training for your brain um, to get you very smart, very analytical. Uh, and so, of course, this, the key skill, one of the key skills that you'll be developing um, from first year onwards is the ability to digest, organize and evaluate uh, complex content. Right. This is a key thing that um, employers need across a wide range of situations, whether you're analyzing uh, the stock markets, doing financial things or you're working for the uh, government. A friend of mine who's um, a diplomat, a British diplomat. Uh, when we were talking about what her job is, she said she basically just has to digest and 
analyze and organize content and present it to uh, political figures so that they can make uh, decisions. So this is a really critical skill and it's uh, one that you'd get through our programs. You'd have experience with qualitative and quantitative methods for handling uh, data. We've got modules that would uh, train you on that and you can take additional modules um, if that's of interest to you. With all of this, you would be encouraged to develop clear and professional presentation of your content, both in writing and orally. So there'll be, of course, the opportunity to get feedback on essays and other forms of written content, but also to deliver presentations orally, which is an absolutely um, key skill, um, both in person, I suppose, increasingly online. With our um, marking rubrics and with the way we assess you, we encourage you very much to think creatively and laterally. And it's often that creative and lateral thinking that would get you the most um, marks, not just being able to repeat what the information is said, but to be able to put it together in an original way, or to be able to challenge it, or to be able to connect things which are not necessarily um, obvious. Okay. Of course, with something, especially something like the final year project, you'd be learning a lot about managing yourself, managing the project and managing your time. Um, university is not like school. Things are not given to you in terms of uh, every hour of your day being accounted for. You have to organize yourself. You have to put together your weekly schedule. Uh, you have to put together in a way how you deliver your project. We will support you with that. But part of what we are encouraging you to do is to become an independent kind of adult in that respect. Working in groups um, and with a lot of the extracurricular um, work that you will do will encourage teamwork and leadership. Um, student societies are great for this. We have a politics society in the department um, that students have really um, used to develop themselves and to um, develop themselves as a group. And finally, I think this is so important, particularly in the contemporary world, um, we will encourage you and you will develop cultural and what we call political competence, how to talk to people with sensitivity, respect and intelligence, who are from very different backgrounds, who have very different beliefs to you, what kinds of things they will find um, uh, useful, how to respectfully disagree, how to think about how to frame what you're saying to make it intelligible to others. This is a key uh, thing, particularly if you want to work in an international context, particularly if you're meeting different kinds of people all the time. How do you carry yourself? How do you talk to people? How do you uh, respectfully engage with and respond to them? To give you a flavor of some of the recent roles that our graduates have gone into, I've just listed a few here. Um, you can see that there's a wide range of um, jobs that people go on to. Um, of course, many people also go on to further study and master's programs. Um, as I said, some have gone on to um, this year on to the States and to St. Andrews. Uh, I've had students go to Cambridge and Oxford and LSE and so on. Um, and people either deepening their knowledge of politics or, uh, or um, developing in a more applied field. But these are some of the jobs that um, students have gone into and hopefully you'll get to see more of um, our alumni over time. We also have a careers uh, service which gives really great um, personalized support. So it'll help you find vacancies, it'll help you find internships uh, and um, it'll help set up meetings with employers and alumni so you can hear more about what they're looking for. Then there's also the individual um, support in terms of careers advice, aptitude testing, CV building and interview and assessment center practice. So that by the time you're ready to hit the job market, you're really well supported with a wide range of skills and all of this tailored support in terms of your employability. Okay, so that is um, the end of our presentation in terms of what we had to say to you. Um, we've got time now for a question and answer, and you can either pop these in the uh, chat or you can um, put your hand up and or unmute yourselves. I'm gonna take the questions that have already been um, put into the chat to give people a chance to get their thoughts together. Um, so we've got a question, um, asking are the politics and international relations degrees at SOAS more research oriented? I mean, I would say they are research oriented and lots of particularly our final year modules give you the opportunity to define the research question yourself, right? This is a key skill in terms of research oriented um, learning. So you can define your own question, choose your own question, and then choose how you are going to go about answering it. And that is the key to um, research. For those that prefer to have um, uh, different kinds of assessment. There are also modules with very different kinds of assessment. So 
One third year module might be assessed with a long essay that you put together the um, rubric for yourself. Uh, another third year module that I've been um, teaching on recently has assessment through detailed engagement with the reading. So you don't have to write a lot, but it's based on your weekly reading and like writing questions which respond to that. So they're very short answers, but the skill that we're testing there is your analytic skills. Have you understood what's being taught, uh, what, you, um, what the reading said, and can you respond to it in a critical uh, kind of way? So there's lots of different ways in which we would cultivate your skills in the degree. Um, as we asked, um, she's from Spain, but for the last two years, she's been studying in England, her A-levels. Does she still have to answer an English language test? That I do not know. I don't think so, but that is something you would have to check with our undergraduate admissions team. Um, I'm going to um, ask our colleague, um, Amani, to put the um, uh, email address in the chat, um, but you will be able to get an answer from them. What do we look for for a personal statement in IR? This is a good question. Um, and you don't take politics at A-level, would this affect your application from Masami? Um, personal statements are really interesting. I think people have tried to pack them with as much kind of extracurricular stuff as possible. I think from my point of view as an admissions tutor who reads personal statements, I just want to see that you're interested in the subject and that you've thought about it. So, tell me about a book that you've read or tell me about an issue that you're interested in or tell me about an experience that you've been involved with um, and show me that you are interested in thinking about that in a more serious way. So for IR, I mean, tell me about an issue that you're interested in, in a book that you've thought, read or thought about it or maybe even a film or a documentary. Um, talk to me about why you want to do this subject. What we really want to see in the personal statement is passion and also some way of showing us your analytic or intellectual um, engagement with, with the area. The extracurricular stuff is fine, it's great. Um, and we encourage people to do it because it makes you more rounded, it gives you more skills, um, and that will always benefit you. You don't take politics at A-level, does this affect your application? No, not really. Um, we do like people to have got related subjects. So history is great, English is great, geography is great, um, uh, sociology or psychology or um, other kinds of social sciences or humanities subjects are all fine. If you are taking predominantly science A-levels, we get a few applicants like this every year, um, really make sure that your personal statement explains why you're kind of switching course and explains and shows us a bit your engagement with ways of thinking analytically about uh, these issues. Um, uh, Masami said she's doing mainly languages for A-levels, and that's also that's also fine. I mean, with languages, you're doing um, a lot of textual work as well. But again, emphasizing the personal statement, how and why you're interested in, in this area. What kinds of extracurricular activities are offered in the um, degrees? So I would say the majority of extracurricular activities um, that students in terms of student societies are offered via the students' union. So there's hundreds of student societies on every interest you could possibly um, kind of think about, uh, from sports groups to political groups to cultural groups, music, dance, um, hobbies, all kinds of things. Within the politics department uh, itself, I would say that we have um, the Politics Society, which is a student group, but which has been closely allied to the department. And that puts on uh, politics related talks, maybe career talks, maybe networking events. Um, the department, of course, also puts on social activities, puts on regular seminars and events that everybody's welcome um, to attend. So we would focus more on the academic side of things and uh, somewhat the social side of things at the level of the department. And then beyond that, Student Union and other kinds of societies um, around SOAS would, would do that. So I'd encourage you to go to the Students Union page, um, which is I think soasunion.org, uh, to have a look at that. Um, if you're retaking A-levels, uh, that will not affect your application. We know that a lot of people, uh, particularly over the last couple of years, for circumstances almost completely outside everyone's control um, have not ended up with the A-level grades that they um, either wanted or uh, deserved and so we understand that a lot of people will be doing retakes we would not look um, we would not look badly on this in fact I would applaud the students um, for wanting to, um, to to improve their grades in that way. Uh, what are the entry requirements to study at SOAS? So they differ from program to program. For our programs, the standard offer would be AAB, um, 
but we do and we are able to take different contextual circumstances into account. Um, so if you think you might qualify um, because maybe you're first in the family to go to university, you've been on free school meals, um, or you know, not many people from your neighborhood go to uni, then um, do inquire because we do uh, try to adjust our offers to take um, unequal circumstances in the world into account. Would we consider applications from an IB student who's done a couple of high levels in different sittings? Yeah, so I mean, the point of the admissions process is to check that you're interested in the subject and that you can do it. If you showed that ability across different sittings rather than all at the same time, that's, that's fine. We're just interested to know that you can actually do the work because it's unfair for us to take you in if you are gonna struggle and if it's not gonna be right for you. Um, and you know, you should also think about if you are trying to get into a uni where the entry grades are far above what you're actually achieving, is that going to be a good experience for you overall? So I would say, you know, think about um, that match. But of course, if we think you can do it, if there's evidence in your academic record that you can achieve at the level um, that we need you to, then we will take that um, very seriously. Do I have any recommended readings to read before starting the IR course? Um, well, there's a lot. Um, I would, I'm gonna type a couple of things into the chat. Um, there's a website called eir.info, which is pretty interesting because it's a student run collective that does lots and lots of coverage of international relations as a subject. So they have interviews, talks, podcasts, essays, all kinds of things on there. And you can really look around at what you're uh, interested in. I think that's pretty um, good. And if you're looking for a um, book, there are some basic texts, um, uh, sort of uh, slight, I mean, uh, there's um, Cynthia Weber's uh, Introduction to International Relations, um, which you can look up um, online. But otherwise I would say reading the essays on eir.info will give you a really good feel for the subject. Great, um, Tolga, did you wanna add anything? And of course, um, feel free to ask questions. We'll be ending in a couple of minutes. Uh, not really. Uh, I uh, maybe just one sort of general and perhaps maybe easy advice in terms of what we look for in personal statements. And Mira knows better about this than me. But you know, Mira, how many applications do you read? Oh gosh, <laughs> a lot, I mean, right? I have read. I have read lots and lots and lots. Yeah, and people go through applications so, quickly. I suppose. Yes. So you know. So as you write your statement, think about this. <laughs> Think about the fact that Mira is going to read a lot of them. So you should try to, you know, write something that would sort of in some way stick out and stick out not in some sort of bizarre way, but, you know, you should really try to uh, uh, make sure that you, you do convey your passion for some right dimension of politics or political phenomena and that, that you're really interested in that and you really want to uh, study this topic in a in a in a, in a disciplined way and you want to spend your your undergraduate years working on that and so i think that type of sort of approach would help you in 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 writing your statement sort of in in the right way that's my my advice um, um there's a question in the chat do any alumni go into media so yes definitely and um, we've had quite a few journalists come out of the uh program um I'm trying to think. So one of the ones that I knew recently um, went into work for the BBC Africa team um, and um, he kind of greatly benefited from his SOAS training in terms of the Africa specialism. What are the seminar sizes? So um, most of our undergraduate uh, modules are taught with a large lecture for the whole group and then a seminar of up to 15 students. Um, that is the general format. So you'll have both large group kind of sessions and small group ones um, and then of course you've got one-to-one -one office hours and so on with your um, tutors. Some of our seminars are taught as a two-hour block um, with say 20-25 students in them and those are more the advanced sessions so you've got more interactive time, um, more engagement with the lecturer, different kinds of group work. Um, so partly the seminar size depends on the format but for the majority of the time it's up to 15. Yeah. Any other final uh, questions before we have to draw things to a close? Right. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing the screen um, now. 
Uh, and if you've got any final questions, I suppose, um, please do drop us a line either to study at soas.ac.uk or if you want to, um, if you want to uh, do um, the politics department, you can go to uh, UG Politics at SOAS sorry, UG Politics Admissions at soas.ac.uk. I'm just putting that in the chat and that will come to me and I will be able to answer your questions. Okay, I'm gonna close it there and hand it over back to Armani. Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for joining and thank you to Mira, Tolga and Felix um, for all the information they've given today. Again, like she said, if you have any sort of general admissions questions, feel free to contact study at sas.ac.uk and then Mira's also put the politics department's email in there. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining today. Thank you, hope to see some of you next year. Bye. Thank you. Bye.